wouldn't you know, we finally made it to the week of the 2024 NFL Draft. And welcome in to First Draft, the final show, at least in this studio, until the games begin on Thursday night. I am Field Yates, and for the 46th consecutive year, Mel Kuyper Jr. will be covering the NFL Draft like no one else can. Mel, I can only imagine all the emotions that are going through your, your mind, your heart, your body right now. How you feeling, my friend? I am feeling great, Field. I couldn't feel better. I think when you look at what we're excited about is all the mystery, all the intrigue. We still don't know for sure what's going to happen from two on, really. We have teams that are going through pivotal drafts. The Dallas Cowboys have to get an A draft. This is critical for them to build up that offensive line. Teams like Arizona, Green Bay, Washington, with a lot of picks inside the first four rounds, have a great opportunity to increase their fan, their, uh, they t- their personnel base, and get that fan base even more excited, particularly in Green Bay, where they could be a Super Bowl contender right with a great draft here so it's going to be really fun to see how it all plays outfield let's tee it up let's get it started can't wait for Roger to get out to announce that first pick and we can start rolling to pick number two I was gonna say that's where the draft sort of feels like it begins we'll get into so much today burning questions leading into the NFL draft and Mel and I will reveal our guys players not likely to be heard in the first round of the draft that we just love Before we get to a couple of different topics, so let's begin here. Just a reminder that we're going to be live at the NFL Draft on Wednesday night. Go to firstdraftlive.com. This is a pre-draft podcast, Wednesday, April 24th. Doors open at 7 p.m. This is going to take place at the Hollywood Casino at Greek Town. Tickets are available now at firstdraftlive.com. $40 $40 a piece, that includes free appetizers, plus some merch for every attendee that is there. And act fast, because right now there's a two-for-one special going on. 40 bucks gets you two tickets. That right there is a pretty darn good value. We'll be discussing lots of value picks over the next 45 or so minutes. Again, firstdraftlive.com. All right, Samuel, you just described to us sort of how you're feeling right now. I would be curious, between now and Thursday night, is more of your attention focused in on preparing for players that you feel like you need to tidy up or is more of the next two and a half, three days simply just playing out all the scenarios in your mind that you foresee could take place on Thursday night? Really, Field, I'm not really as much into the predictions as making sure all the ratings are set and that's all put to bed. Obviously, yours are, mine are. So ratings are done. Okay, we want to see how it's going to play out. Then you talk to your teams and your friends in the National Football League, as we all do, try to just get a feeling for what they are hearing because they're not going to tell you what they're doing, Field. I've had people in the league tell me what they're doing, but you had to wait till they were on the clock, obviously. My friends say, hey, when we're on the clock, you're feel free and I always mix that name in with some others, right? Protect your friends in the league, whatever, about who they may take, right? But I don't even like to know because then if something comes out and say, hey, I didn't know, don't blame it on me. So normally I use my friends in the league to help me with what other teams, what they're hearing about trade-ups, trade-downs, who's calling the most, things like that, who's hot, who's not, yeah, pro days for, for guys that weren't even dra- uh, at the combine. It may, some may go late, some may go undrafted. So we're even worrying about priority free agents field this time of year. So yeah, we're going to be doing day three, and we're going to be worrying about guys that are, that are brought in the day after as free agents. So it really is just trying to get – Everything done. You always feel like field. The one thing you always feel like you're gonna miss somebody, yeah. right? You're always gonna miss a guy. No way. It goes Not in the first you, five, six rounds, or you no. didn't have enough. Yeah, you can field. You Not got you. Or, or you have to wait too low, way too low, way too high. All that stuff plays out, which makes it so much more entertaining when you do get shocked. And people, I think fans love it field when you and I are sitting there saying, what the heck just happened? Why did this guy go so high? Or why is my guy still on the board? I think fans really like that more than everything you know, as scripted playing out because that's boring. And they, they want, they'd like to see people that study this 365 days a year be wrong or have a different opinion than what the NFL has. Okay, Mel, so that's fair. I hope that does not happen to us too often because you certainly hope that you're bored kind of aligns with how things actually shake out once the draft begins on Thursday night. Of course, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Mel on ESPN all three, day, three days. A fixture that he has been uh, on ESPN for about 40 years now during the draft weekend coverage. Let's get into some burning questions. We're going to do so in just a moment when First Draft returns. All right, back here on First Draft, he's Mel Kuyper Jr. I am Field Yates. And Mel, let's dive into some burning questions that people are wondering about just days away from the NFL Draft. And this is going to kind of be some of the stuff that we've talked about a bunch over the past few months, and then some new stuff as well. But let's begin at the top, Mel. We know it's Caleb Williams going quarterback one. 
who is going to be quarterback two in your mind, and who do you think the Commanders should take if you were Adam Peters making the call yourself? I'm Adam Peters. I'm not worrying about anything but us getting the best player. I don't really care about things like I want to be a Raider, Jaden Daniels, and Antonio Pierce. We get that connection going back to Arizona State days, right? I'm taking the best quarterback. This is the way the NFL works. You don't pick where you go. We pick you, mm. okay? You come to us. You're the quarterback. We got an offensive line. We're going to build up. We did a couple things in free agency. We got a couple picks in the early second round. Jaden Daniels has a great opportunity with the Washington Commanders, I believe. And I think if I, certainly no question, if I'm the, making that pick, it's Jaden Daniels. Do I think it will be? I don't know, Field. I think it could and it should. Will it be? Could it be Drake May? Maybe. I don't know. You know Adam Peters hasn't told me, Field. I don't know who he's told. I think he's done a great job. And maybe the NFL has wanted this. And we know they have. I don't know if they're in the ear of Adam Peters saying, hey, don't tip your hand. Because we know who one's going to be. We don't want to know who two's going to be. So throw out all the names. Keep it a guessing game. Keep the mystery, keep the intrigue there, and that's what everybody wants. Because, hey, you don't know what the, the presents are under the tree, right, Till Christmas morning. Yeah. Let's wait it out. I'm glad Adam Peters handled it this way. But if you ask me who I think it will be and who I would take, they both worked in lockstep, it would be Jaden Daniels. Yeah, I would say Jaden Daniels as well, Mel. And let's just sort of lay out a couple of the reasons why I might prefer Jaden Daniels to Drake May, who I think a lot of people feel like is the other player in contention for being the second-best quarterback in this year's draft class. We can talk about the skill sets of these players. We can also discuss the outcomes for them, Mel. And I believe personally that the floor for Jaden Daniels is higher than the floor for Drake May. And maybe that's in part because Jaden Daniels has five years of college experience. Drake has just two years as a starting quarterback at the collegiate level. So I feel like I know what the peaks and valleys look like more for Jaden Daniels than I do with Drake May. But I also believe the ceiling is higher. And that, of course, is because of what we saw this past year. And Jaden Daniels' skill set is so hard to replicate, right, Mel? I mean, we're talking about a player who the minute that you bring him into your franchise, he obviously changes your offense, right? There's a reason why he's going to go with one of the first three picks, no doubt. But he also changes the way that teams can play defense. It just completely changes the math, right? We're seeing more and more in today's NFL of offenses creating optionality every single play, right? RPOs, making linebackers and defensive ends and corners and safeties have to declare on one side or the other, basically at the snap. And J.D. Daniels' speed on top of his throwing ability, I think makes him sort of the ultimate force multiplier for an offense, which really, really stresses a defense. Let's go to the pick three, Mel, because uh, at three, again, the Patriots, I think, should be taking a quarterback. Well, let's talk about what you think they will do and what you think they should do as well, Mel, because there are options that go beyond just taking a quarterback, one of which I think the most logical other option would be trading back. What would you do if you're Elliot Wolf in his first draft in this capacity? You have to get the quarterback. Right, you can't Thank get you. cute here. You can't fool around. You can't trade down and worry about getting back up because you could lose the quarterback you love. And I don't know who that quarterback is because two are going to be gone. Okay, let's assume it's Caleb and, and Jaden. Okay, we know Caleb, Jaden goes too. Drake May, do you love him? If you don't, take J.J. McCarthy or trade down and, and try to do some things there. But if you love J.J., you got to take him because if you move down, you're going to lose him. Mm. I wouldn't take J.J. that high, but if they love him, I don't think moving down is really an option field because you got the Giants sitting in there. My feeling is whoever they love, they got to take. And it's got to be one of the four remaining quarterbacks, either Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, Michael Penix Jr., or Bo Nix, right? It's got to be one of those four. I'm not taking the other two that high. I'm moving down. If I want Penix Jr. or Nix, I'll move off of that pick. But if I want one of the two, May or McCarthy, moving down, you're going to lose them. You're going to lose them. Yeah. So you can't lose a guy you love. Now, if they don't love either one of them, and they like Penix Jr. or Nix a little better or as much, then moving down makes a little more sense, right, to build up that talent base by getting extra picks. But this is a risky move if you go off a of three. You cannot – my feeling is you can't love May or McCarthy and move off a of three. Mm. If they move off a of three, it tells me they don't like either one field yep. enough to take them that high, and they don't think they're franchise quarterbacks. Yeah, I would agree with that. If they're trading down, it's because they are not as enamored in those players, at least in the case, the case of Drake May, as you and I are, Mel. But I will continue to feel this way. If the Patriots stay at three 
they should take whichever of Jaden Daniels and Drake May is left over. And while we think it's going to be Jaden Daniels at pick number two, we don't know it like we do with Caleb Williams, who is going to be mm -hmm. the first pick in the 2024 NFL Draft. And Drake May, Mel, has so much potential and upside. And maybe there are fans that are watching this right now and say, I hate those words. I don't want to hear those words during the draft process, right? Potential and upside can get you fired if you're a GM. I get it, but there's also been some darn good production as well, Mel. 21 years old. I think about how the Patriots, over the past couple of years, it doesn't snow nearly as much in New England as it did when I was growing up here, Mel, but the Patriots play like five bad weather games at home a season. You need a quarterback that's got stature, it's got a big hand, it's got a rocket arm to cut through the winds, kind of like what Buffalo has up there with Josh Allen. I'm not saying Drake May is now or is necessarily going to be Josh Allen when he reaches his peak version of himself. But that stature, I do think, is important when you're factoring in the elements of where you play. That rocket arm for Drake, so impressive. The in and out of pocket mobility, so impressive for Drake May. I get it. It wasn't a perfect 2023 mail, but I don't find it that hard to dig deep into the archives of Drake May and find plays that make me think he's going to be a star. And I don't think there are too many traits that Drake May is not quite A-plus at right now that aren't coachable. I think most of the things that are currently bothering Drake May are coachable relative to other quarterbacks that are going to go maybe fourth, fifth, or sixth off the board, Mel, that I don't think you can coach out of them what they have in them right now. Where do you stand on Drake as pick three? There was a song, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, Phil. Remember that? Oh, I'm sick and tired of people acting like when you say something negative about a player, you hate that player. Yeah, there, all these quarterbacks have something that they have to improve on, right? Well, you think about where we were back when Ben Roethlisberger, Phillip Rivers, and Eli Manning came in. You had to rank them one, two, three. So if you liked one over two, two or three, there had to be a reason, right? Even if you're splitting hairs, you got to give a reason. When we're ranking these guys, it doesn't mean we hate one or the other or love the one guy significantly over the other. You got to make a decision. You can't say uh, they're all the same. Well, you got to pick one. If you're picking two, you can't take them all. You got to pick one of those guys. Same thing at three and moving on down, right? So and then you rate them to protect you from overdrafting. I'm not taking JJ McCarthy in the top 10. I like him. I don't love him, and I got to love him to make him a top 10 pick. So let somebody else take him. Now, if he slipped into the middle of the first, I'd be happy to take JJ. That's what ranking players protect you from doing. Now, if hmm. he gets down that far, I'm, I'm happy. So why wouldn't you take him in the top three if you take him at 15? Because that's how you rank him. And if somebody else takes him that high, it protects you from that overdrafting mistake. That's the why we go through this exercise field. So when you talk about Drake May, it's interesting. All of a sudden, last week, I'm hearing, well, they're 21 years old, and they got all this potential. They, they're not. They're you know all these guys that have played forever. They they maxed their out. They're going. These are these are veteran guys. These are these are 23, 24 year old guys against college kids, right? They're maxed out. All of a sudden now the experience that we wanted just not that long ago we don't want anymore. Now we want the the guys who have potential and have flaws but are still young and hadn't played a lot of football. We got to figure out what we want. I said all year field. The NFL and all of us are clueless on quarterbacks, right? Nobody has any perfect formula. They haven't shown me yet how to draft quarterbacks. You might be right one year and dreadfully wrong the next year or bad one year and great the next year, right? But when you get that quarterback, thank your lucky stars you have them for 10, 12, 15 years, like Brady, 20 years, right? Yeah. Because it's not easy. This evaluation process on quarterbacks is incredibly difficult. Anybody that thinks they have the answers field, you know what? You tell them they're a liar. They're a clue. They have no idea. Yeah. They might get it right one time, but I'll get you, get you. Next year, they may get it really wrong. So you go from A to an F or an F to an A very quickly. So if I'm ranking players, it's for that reason field. Try to protect yourself from doing what the league tends to always do, which is overdraft quarterback. I can tell it's draft week because we are getting the best version of, version of Mel right now. I'll fire it up, Mel Kuyper Jr. You absolutely love to see uh -huh. it. Must be Can't draft wait. week. All right, so just a couple more here, Mel, before we move off of the burning questions portion of the show. So if it does go quarterback, 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 does that mean that the draft kind of starts to pick number four in your estimation? And if you're the Cardinals, same deal. Do you resist temptation and sit there and take Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors? Or do you say, we want more picks. we got too many holes to worry about just one player. Let's move back and see if the Vikings are willing to trade us 11-23 in a first-round pick in 2025 to take that fourth quarterback. Here's my feeling on the Cardinals field. They have all these picks, right? Yeah. But they don't have a big-time receiver. They don't. Larry Fitzgerald at one point was drafted third overall. You have to get the receiver. You can't lose 
Marvin Harrison Jr., Romo Dunze, and Malik Neighbors. If those three aren't a Cardinal field, it's a D draft or an F draft. I don't mm. care what they – it's not a great draft if they don't get one of those three. Yeah. I don't care how good those other receivers may be. The great ones, the elite ones are those three. Completely they, agree. I don't care how Monty Austin Fort, Monty Hall, let's make a deal. I don't care how he maneuvers <laughs> up, down, around. He's got to get one of those three. Yeah. At the end of the day, one of those three have got to be a Cardinal. That's the biggest need. These are three studs. Don't get too cute and lose one of the three. And I don't care which one of the three you get, but get one of the three. Yeah, Mel, and if you move too far down, if you go from 4 to 11, wave those guys goodbye because they oh, are not it. getting past 8, 9, 10 mm -hmm. if you sit there at number 11. So if the Cardinals want to redo what they did last year, which is trade down, last year they went from 3 to 12 and then 12 to 6. If you have that deal in your back pocket, we're going from 4 to 11, and we already have a handshake agreement with Tennessee, or Monty Austin for it used to work, by the way. I'm just making this up, but I'm just saying. If you go from 4 to 11, and then 11 to 7, Mel, I'm fine with it because you're guaranteed one of those three wide receivers no. because Minnesota is trading up only for a quarterback. If you go from 4 to 11, and all of a sudden your draft board includes lots of extra picks, but none of the great three receivers – Things a little bit different there for Arizona. Last thing here quickly, Mel, is if you're the Chargers at pick number five, is priority A moving down the board to add extra draft capital? It's a tough call for me because I love the receiver so much, and, and Justin Herbert needs a receiver. Yeah. And what he's got to do for Justin to get over the hump is finish out games, right? Final couple minutes of a game, take your team down the field. Okay, win the game late. That's what they have to do. When you're talking about wide receivers in this draft, there are those three studs. They need one of those three, but they also need a right tackle. And they had a kid, Quentin Johnson, last year. They have him who didn't play as well as you thought he or hoped he could play. Didn't play up to the level of Zay Flowers or Jordan Addison, right? So the bottom line is if Johnston improves, great, right? And you got Palmer and, da and Davis, got other guys. But you need that, got that big-time receiver, and you have him sitting there for you to pass that guy up. It's going to have to take a pretty good deal field for me to move out of there and lose Neighbors or Odunze, right? So if I'm moving down, I'm looking at right tackle. I'm looking at a J.C. Latham from Alabama, Tali Fuaga from Oregon State. And I'm looking at the depth at wide receiver to maybe bring in a Brian Thomas Jr. and Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell. So that's where the charge is at the figure. Do we want to gain more picks, draft capital, we may be in a pick next year, and lose that dynamite receiver or are we okay with that receiver that we'll get maybe moving down that we can figure those extra picks make a lot of sense when we got to do it? So this is a tough call for the Chargers because that receiver is so needed. Yeah. And that's why, for me, moving down would take a, I would say, a blockbuster offer where they have to give you everything and the ranch, but it would take a pretty good haul for me to get, the, if I'm the Chargers, to move off of five and lose neighbors or Odunze for Justin Herbert. Mel, if this was any other head coach, I think we'd be saying – Sit there at number five and take the best receiver available. But because it's Jim Harbaugh, who in his NFL history as a head coach had great success without a ton of high-level investments at the wide receiver spot that he himself drafted, that to me is the only reason why we're having this conversation. To say that Jim Harbaugh and his new GM, Joe Hortiz, will march to the beat of their own drum is the understatement of the century as it pertains to the 2024 NFL draft. We'll see what they decide to do. But coming up next year on First Draft, we're going to dive deeper into that special trio of wide receivers, plus the great Brock Bowers. We'll talk landing fits and skill set. That's next. All right, back here on First Draft, Mel Kuyper Jr. I am Field Yates. We're going through some more burning questions here, Mel, and let's talk about these pass catchers. And what I want to do is talk through Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors. We'll start with Marvin Harrison Jr. and talk about landing spots, Mel, but also just a refresher why you have them the ranked the way that you do. And let's start with the skill set of Marvin Harrison Jr. One of these three has to be one. One of them has to be three. Why is Marvin Harrison Jr. the top-ranked wide receiver in your board? Because I've been on him so long, fielding with the world's been on him so long, okay? We've known about him, knew about his dad. His greatness at Ohio State was obvious long before this year. And he's maintained that. Did he have a couple concentration drops? Who didn't? Field? Did he make spectacular catches on a regular basis in contested situations? Yes, he did. Was he the key element when a team two years ago that beats Georgia, he doesn't get hurt late in the third quarter? Yes, he is. So for me, when you look at what he means to that football team, it's everything. Marvin Harrison Jr. meant it all because when he wasn't out there for C.J. Stroud two years ago, that fourth quarter went awry. 
Georgia came back. They won that football game, right? I said they don't win that game. Ohio State was in command of that game when Marvin Harrison got hit by Javon Bullard and didn't return, right? This year, he actually, in a couple areas, did better and were equal to what he did last year, even with Kyle McCord and not C.J. Stroud. So the, the production didn't wane. You see it, the touchdowns, the average per catch. Yes, the receptions were down, but Kyle McCord isn't even a Buckeye right now. He's with Syracuse. So for me, maintain your – why would I change? If I loved them two years ago, what happened this year? I love Romo doing saying, by the way, I made a chance. He is my number two receiver. I'm staying true to who I am all year. And I went with neighbors because of speed. And back. This week I just said, uh-uh, I'm, I'm going back to Rome. I've been Rome all along. I love neighbors too, but I'm going to rank them. It's Marvin Harrison one, Romo Dunze two, Malik neighbors three. That's final. It's etched in stone. Marvin Harrison Jr. Loved them then, loved them now, and I'm not getting off. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the number one receiver in this draft. One thing I'll say, Mel, is I have Marvin Harrison Jr. also ranked as my number one wide receiver, third player overall after the two quarterbacks, Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels. And part of the reason why I do believe there is a very credible case for the Cardinals to not move at all and just take Marvin Harrison Jr. is that if I told you back in September at the beginning of the season or back in January at the end of the season for college football, you had the opportunity without knowing the order, without knowing the teams, without knowing their needs, without knowing what would take place from January until April 25th for somebody at pick four to take Marvin Harrison Jr., would you consider that a value? A reach, an overreach, and I think most people would say that's a value. Getting a player of that caliber, pick number four, is a tremendous value for the Cardinals. I'm staying right there at number four overall as well, at least I think in my final mock draft. If I were the Cardinals, I would not trade down. I would simply take this potentially transcendent talent. Let's go to those next two wide receivers, the male, because you just said that Roma Dunze has leapfrogged Malik Neighbors in your final rankings. To me, this is almost like choosing between your two children. It's hard to do. There's no right or wrong answer. But give us the reason why you wound up on Roma Dunze over Malik Neighbors. Stay true to who you are, Field. I mean, I got off and I said, I smacked myself. I said, oh, what are you, crazy? You've been on Romo <laughs> Dunze all year. Yeah. Love everything about it. What did he do? He tested great. He works hard. He does everything on the field. He didn't have Jalen McMillan. Jalen Polk stepped up, yet he was the go-to guy. And nobody could contain him. Forget about slowing him down. He couldn't contain him. Utah held him to three catches. Two were touchdowns. You know, he's got it all. Route running. He's got the ability, that burst, that deceptive speed that I think defensive backs take bad angles because they, they, they misread his speed because they, they don't realize how fast and how athletic and what a freak he is. He works as hard as anybody. He's been the guy, look at this, contested, catch radius. He's done as much there as Marvin Harrison Jr. has. More than anybody in the country this past year in contested situations, down the field vertically. He does it all. Look at the average per catch, right? Look at the touchdowns. Now, he had good stats in 2022, but not to the level of this season. So, for me, Rome has been burning guys for years now, but he did it at a highest level this season with Michael Penix Jr. Love the kid, love the player, love the talent. There's no reason when you run as well as he did under 4-5 at his size with incredible athleticism. You're talking about with a 38 vertical. And then the production matches everything. Yes, Malik Neighbors faster than a 40. And that's why I said, I'll flip the two. there. No, I went with Romo Dunsley at the final end of the day, made that call. I love them all, but Rome, I'm staying true to, loyal to. And I was there in the beginning. I'm not going to get off him now. I think he's, if he becomes a third receiver, so be it. I can understand that. Malik yeah. Neighbors is, is explosive and he can fly. I get it. But Romo Dunze is a special player for me. Okay, so I have Malik Neighbors over Romo Dunze. Mel, it's as simple as the explosiveness. I think he's the most explosive player in the draft. We are picking nits here right now. But Malik Neighbors and that 4 4 40 the 27 forced missed tackles last season, the ability to take – an eight-yard hook and turn it into an 18 or a 28 or a 50-yard, 50 58-yard reception is too good for me to ignore on top of the fact that, of course, he can run right by you. Next thing you know, you've got a 50-yard touchdown pass off the arm of Jaden Daniels. As we saw, by the way, first quarter against Alabama, against a secondary that could have three players drafted, ran right past that entire Alabama secondary. We saw that all the time this past year. And obviously, there's a lot of SC, NFL caliber SEC, uh, excuse me, NFL caliber defensive backs in the SEC. None of them had an answer for Malik Neighbors, but we still have these players ranked so close to each other, Mel. So we can fight about this until we're blue in the face, but ultimately, it's probably going to be rendered moot on Thursday night because I can't imagine either one of them has to wait that long to hear their names called. So let's talk about fits here, Mel. Where do you think Malik Neighbors ends up on Thursday night? We'll start there, and then we'll talk about Roma Dunze because it sounds like 
Whenever one goes, the other is within a, within a few picks at absolute worst. It's going to be a lot of fun to see who they end up with. i got to believe Marvin Harrison Jr. to Arizona, Malik Neighbors, Giants, because of that ability. We say they don't get explosive plays in the passing game. They haven't had any for Daniel Jones. They've had a 1,000-yard receiver since 2018, Odell Beckham Jr. This is the kind of guy, speed, attitude. You think about it, he's a baller. He says, hey, I play through ankle injuries and knee, this issue, shoulders sore, knees sore, everything sore. I don't care. I'm a Louisiana guy. I'm playing through it. So Malik Neighbors for the Giants. That's why taking that quarterback, yes, okay, we know they may take a quarterback, but taking one over these receivers, you're not going to help Daniel Jones with a Malik Neighbors or a Romo Dunze and take a J.J. McCarthy. You're going to go that route? Daniel Jones has no chance. You might as well let J.J. play. Yeah. Come on. I mean, what are you doing? He's coming off injuries. He's got an offensive line you think is going to be better, right? And But you don't have that explosive receiver, and you passed on him with, with this to take the air apparent. So, for me, that's going to be an interesting pick, the Giants. But Malik Neighbors, Romo Dunze, right in this general area, figure to come off the board. Mel, I think if either of those players is available at pick nine, it's the absolute floor for them. That would be the Chicago <laughs> Bears, of course. I don't think it happens. Mm -hmm. and, I don't, and I understand that, like, if four quarterbacks go in the first – five or six picks, then there's only room for one other player besides three receivers to go off the board, yeah. right? And you think Joel could be a top 10 lock. Would Atlanta take a defensive player after signing Kirk Cousins and Darnell Mooney and going very offensive this offseason? Yet my brain just keeps coming back to this, Mel. Find someone in the NFL that doesn't think the world of any of these wide receivers. You can't. Everybody loves these three wide receivers. The idea that any of them could be the top-ranked wide receiver in a lot of classes, and it wouldn't be close. Could one oh, of those yeah. caliber players really fall all the way to pick number nine, Mel? Maybe I'm way off, and maybe I have completely missed the boat, but I keep coming back to the idea that whether it's a team with a top-eight pick or somebody trading into the top eight, these three receivers feel like they are likely to go within the first eight picks of the upcoming NFL draft. Am I nuts? Not at all, Field. I'm anxious to see that somebody trade up to get, say, Romo Dunze, right? Is there at 7, 8, 9. The Bears obviously would have to take him. People say, well, you have DJ Moore and you brought in Keenan Allen. Come on. Another receiver like this, a big-time young receiver who's got a lot of great years ahead, okay, for Caleb Williams. Are you kidding me? If I'm the Bears, I'm, I'm, I'm running that. Clock. I'm shocked that he's there at 9. I'm taking him. I know they need a pass rusher. I understand that. They have no second-round pick. Trading down's an option. But if Rome's there, you're taking him. I just want to see, does a Buffalo Bill team make a monumental leap up? It's happened before, but Atlanta going from 27 to 6 to get Julio Jones. Does Buffalo go up and get Romo Dunze? Mm. Does somebody else make a move up ahead of Chicago to get him? And is somebody like Atlanta willing to get off of Dallas Turner, who they need, edge rusher out of Alabama, to move down? Tennessee needs a, 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 a Joe Walt desperately. Do they move down? Somebody's got to move down. You need a dance partner field to make a deal. You do. I don't know who moves off of their pick to let you get up there and get Rome. But I will say this, Mel. Is it totally crazy to think that Tennessee or Atlanta could take a wide receiver as well? I mean, I get it. Tennessee signed Calvin no. Ridley. But they got DeAndre Hopkins in the final year of a two-year contract in his 30s. And Calvin Ridley is a really good player, obviously. But you need more than one, right? So I haven't totally dismissed the idea, understanding that Tennessee absolutely needs an offensive tackle. I mean, they need two offensive tackles, realistically. But maybe they say, hey, we have so much trust in Bill Callahan one of the great offensive line coaches in the history of the sport, that we feel like we can find somebody at the top of the second round to play offensive tackle for us because we're not letting go of a guy who has a potential, you know, Pro Bowl level grade in one of those three wide receivers. Is that nuts? Where Brian Callahan come from? He came from Cincinnati. Yeah. Brian Callahan came from a Bengal team that took, you know, had Penny Sewell. Or I got to keep Joe Burrow. I got you got to get Penny Sewell. And they took them Jamar Chase and reunited him with Joe Burrow, and it worked out great. Now Joe Burrow has had injuries because that offensive line's been a little leaky, right? And Joe Burrow's taking some hits. But this is the tough call for Brian Callahan. This is a tough call for the Tennessee Titan organization. Rand Carthon. You think about. Offensive tackle, critical need. Will Levis got hurt. Will Levis, a big, strong guy, got 
You see that hit he took? Yeah. Do you see how they, they were coming at him from all angles? I mean, Will Levis barely survived, and then he didn't survive. He yeah. got through some games. I don't know how. Then finally got hurt, didn't play in the final game. You got to protect him, but you need you could use a, certainly a want a Romo Dunze. But Joe Alt's sitting there. That's that's why this draft is the most fascinating draft I've been associated with in 46 years field because all these teams have incredibly tough decisions to make when their pick is up. And I will continue to say, I think Atlanta is part of that conversation as well. I, I understand they paid Darnell Mooney, and I understand they have Drake London. These are special prospects. Special prospects in Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. If they're sitting there at pick eight, it's going to be very, very difficult for somebody to say, we got this amazing grade on one of these wide receivers. we got a lower grade on somebody else. So we really pass up this blue chip grade. One of the things that I am keeping my eyes out on Thursday night for. All right, last one here, Mel, before we move on to our guys is Brock Bowers. Such a great player, offensive weapon inside the top eight players for both you and I. But what's the floor for a guy like Brock Bowers? I don't know. I got to believe it's 15 to the Colts. Yeah. I, I, I'm just guessing. You know how I love Brock Bowers. He's seven on the big board. The Jets, obviously, if they move down off of 10, I think it would be a good move to move off of 10 if they can recoup a second round pick, right? Brock Bowers is a special player. And I don't care where you're playing, where you put him, he's going to catch passes. He's going to be able to run with the football. He's going to get you yards after the catch, and he'll block well enough. So to me, I don't know. Jets want to move down. The Colts, if he's there, I don't think he gets past 15 field. What are you hearing? I don't know where Brock Bowers is going to go. All I know is when you get the seventh best player field in that 10 to 15 area, you got to feel pretty doggone good. I would agree as well, Mel. He's going to be a value no matter where he lands because I don't think it's going to be within those first seven or eight picks. It's just such a fascinating dilemma. We have talked about this a ton over the past three, three and a half months is that, well, he's a great player. The league does not value tight ends at the same level that it does elite wide receivers. I know that you'll tell me he's not just a tight end. He's an offensive weapon. But when it comes time to negotiate a contract, a team is going to say, hey, relative to other tight ends in the market, here's how much they're making. So here's how much we can pay you. What a great player Brock Bowers is. But it wouldn't surprise me, like you said, Mel, if he ends up going closer to 15 than he does going to number 10 overall the Jets at number 10 of course a team to keep an eye on for Brock Bowers I gotta think and maybe I'm nuts I think the Jets end up taking an offensive tackle Joe Douglas their GM it's his blood it's his DNA it's the position he played in college when he was teammates with our guy Todd 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 but I think Joe Douglas even with the two additions this offseason of Morgan Moses and also Tyron Smith would have a very hard time walking into the season next year with such bad offensive line depth such a difficult position, Mel, to find players you can keep upright. I don't think they pick a 10 field. I think the, I, I'm moving off a 10. I think they'll get an well, offer. Back. I think they'll move off a 10. To your point, I think Ooh. offensive line, certainly, but move off a 10 and try to recoup a second-round pick. Hey, go from 10 to 15. Maybe grab yourself a Tali Fuaga. All right, coming up, Mel, we're going to dive into our guys, <laughs> our favorite players who probably won't go in the first round of the NFL draft. That's up next year on First Draft. All right, back here on First Draft, Mel Kuyper Jr., Field Yates, just days away from the 2024 NFL Draft. And Mel, our guys, probably a segment we could have done a long, long time ago, but I think people that watch a lot or listen to a lot of First Draft have a general sense of the players that you and I are more enamored with than quote-unquote consensus for whatever that is worth. But give me three players that you just absolutely love in this year's draft class, Mel. I'm going to go offensive side of the ball field. Start out with Isaac Grendo. So you say, well, he ran 4-3-3, right? Think about this. He was a wide receiver in high school. He goes to Wisconsin. He's playing behind Jonathan Taylor, Braylon Allen. So he's not going to get a lot of carries. Gets an opportunity, showcases his skills, does a really good job, keeps developing. Only 231 career carries after he goes to Louisville from Wisconsin for this past year. He did more at Louisville this year than he had done all the years at Wisconsin combined. Why? Because mm. they had Jonathan Taylor and Braylon Allen. Yeah. This past year at Louisville, 810 yards, 11 touchdowns, 22 catches. 231 career carries, Field, right? 231. Braylon Allen has almost 600 career carries. Blake Corum has 675. He has 231. Even Jonathan Brooks, who played behind Roshan Johnson and the great B. John Robinson and got hurt November 11th, has more carries than Isaac Garendo. He's downhill. He's hard-nosed. He'll be a one-cut runner. He'll block. He'll catch. He is a physical 
physical running back with 4-3-3 speed on a 6-foot, 220-plus pound frame with a wide receiver background in high school? Are you kidding me? I will take Isaac Garendo anywhere field from the fourth, fifth round area and feel great about it. I will hit on my running back on day three with Isaac Garendo. Okay, so 4-3-3 speed certainly caught all of our attention, that big body physical run. Yep. Right, a great bowl game, of course, as well, Mel. Yep. That's number one. Number two, another offensive player. You got all the offense in your feelings today. I, I just want points. I'm a fantasy guy today. Yeah, you know, there we fantasy. go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go Malachi Quarterly. I don't hear enough about Malachi. I'm hearing about all these other receivers. Yes, he doesn't run all the routes that you need. He's a bubble screen sensation. Short passes, everything underneath. He'll take it and he'll go. But a guy that draws comps, Matt Miller, I'm sure, would say he's Debo Samuel. Watch him, Field. Catch the ball, right? And look at this guy. If that's a, that's a running back with a wide receiver frame, watch these short passes. Passes. The bubble screen guy, look at it. He will run through you. He's going to be tough to tackle. You're going to see him break tackles. Yards after catch, you're going to see it right here. Yards after contact. He's a running back playing that wide receiver spot. Again, short passes turn into long gainers with Scott. Break and tackle. If you're a defensive back linebacker, you better bring it with this kid. The production off the charts. Ohio State, eight catches he had a couple years ago. He's done it all. Doesn't matter who he's played field. Malachi Corley, Western Kentucky. I'm thinking second round, maybe third round area, but I know I'm getting myself a tough kid who will be dynamic in that slot. And if you're getting the ball, you can utilize him in a lot of different ways. I'd even put him in the backfield some like Debo. This kid is a tough guy to handle. He, I used to say it was C.D. Lamb, was C.D. Y.A.C. Malachi Corley is the yak guy. He's the yak king, and yeah. he will be a real good. If he, I'll tell you what, if he's there in the third round field, will he be? Will he be in the third round available? Ah, Mel, I think he's a late two slash early three. That's what I, if I had to guess. All right. Yeah. Okay. And Mel, by the way, um, over the past three years, he leads all of FBS in yards after the catch. So he is the yak king over the past three seasons, huh. and he has 77 forced or evaded tackles, forced missed tackles or evaded tackles, which I know, Mel, you're big into these uh, crazy, quirky stats. That's second most over the past three seasons in all of FBS. So he's a hard guy to wow. bring down. He's tough. He's fearless. He is the Yak King. All right, one more for you, Mel, one of your guys. And everybody loves all those Washington wide receivers, but they had another pass catcher that you certainly were drawn to. I like Jack Westover. I like a guy who's Mr. Reliable, Third down, didn't matter. Michael Penix Jr., you got Rome, right? You got Jalen McMillan, you got Jalen Polk, you got Devin Culp, you got the two bookend tackles, Fautanu and Rosengarten, and here's Jack Westover, former walk-on, right? He's a basketball star. Doesn't do much in high school, but when he gets going, great athletic ability, great hands, very competitive. You talk about a guy this past year who put up the numbers, key guy. You talk about a guy who was a vital part of their offense. 6'2 and a half, 243 pounds. You can use him as an H-back, Move tight end. This kid came through time and time again with key plays in that passing game for the Washington Huskies. Very underrated player. And I love a guy who battled his way. Basketball guy to his final year of high school, then injured. Comes in, walk on, waits his turn, figures it out, gets on the field, does a lot of things to get the attention of the coaching staff. And every opportunity he had, all he did was catch the ball when it was thrown to him, give you everything he has. And I know Michael Penix Jr. knew when I put the ball in that area of that kid, I'm going to be happy with the result. Jack Westover's there, field, fifth, sixth, seventh round. I'm turning in the card. He's my guy. And I, gu I guarantee you, I guarantee you, he will have a role on an NFL team, and he will be a steal in the fifth, sixth, seventh round. Mel, couldn't agree more. He's got those no-gloves approach. Doesn't wear the gloves. Just crazy to me, especially with Mike Penix throwing in a million miles an hour. And let me say this, Mel. This might cater more to the younger demographic that's watching us than anybody else. My guy, Jack Westover, needs to change numbers. The number 37 is not a good look for anybody, unless you're Rodney Harrison playing safety back in the day. He made it look cool, did Jack How Westover. That's 44, Field. That's fine by How me. That's 44. Give me 44 for Jack Westover, and he might become 10% better as a player. That's part of my Jack Westover forecast at the NFL level. All right, my turn to give you my three mail, and I don't think you'll be surprised to hear number one. It's Jalen Polk, the Washington wide receiver, who I think probably goes somewhere in that second round. Jalen Polk. The other Washington wide receiver, perhaps the other Washington wide receiver in some people's eyes. He spent one year at Texas Tech. Actually played, came from the same high school as Des Bryant. Talk about that for some lineage. This guy is tough. 
he makes so many contested catches, Mel, and he makes so many catches that aren't necessarily the highlight reel Odell Beckham Jr. catching the football with two fingers, but makes so many catches that are in tight areas or when he's posting up a, per a perimeter corner, doing things outside of his frame so consistently, making the difficult things look effortless. I think the run after catch skill is fine. I get it. He had a 4 5 2 40. Not going to blow you away in that regard, Mel. But if you're looking for a guy who is consistently making the difficult things look easy, it's Jalen Polk. He had a wonderful game against Michigan State in which he was making catches like he was part of Cirque de Soleil, was great at the pro day. Love seeing the energy he brought to the table here, Mel. I'm in on Jalen Polk. I think he deserves to go somewhere in the second round. Yeah, Jalen Jawad. I'm like Jalen McMillan all along. You like Jalen Polk all along. We got Westover, Fautanu, Rosengarten. We got them all covered. These Washington Huskies all over the place field. So I'm with you. Michael Penix Jr. had did a great job, right? He was really good at Indiana when he was out there, but he was hurt, right? But when he was out there, he was a difference maker at Indiana. He was great at Washington, but he had a heck of a lot of help. All right, so let's go to my next guy who is on my guy's list. It is Duke defensive lineman Dwayne Carter the second male. Mm -hmm. And uh, his dad played at Ohio State back in the early 90s, so it's possible that you actually scouted his dad back in the day. He didn't end up going to Columbus. He instead goes down to Duke, becomes the first ever three-year captain for the Duke Blue Devils program. And while the numbers are not going to blow you away in any way, shape, or form here, Mel, the production as far as pressures and making life miserable for opposing offensive linemen, I think will blow you away. He's powerful. He's got some explosion. He's got some twitch to him. He's versatile. While he, of course, can line up in a three technique or over the center, he can also kick out a little bit over towards the edge and give you some snaps there as well. Did not come off the field a lot. Impressed by the character. Impressed by the player. Had a good senior bowl week, Mel. I am in on Dwayne Carter the second. I think he deserves to go somewhere in the early third round. Yeah, I think when you get into that 8, 9, 10 area, when you're ranking the defensive tackles, that's where I think he would fall in for me, Field. I'm with you. I think third, fourth round. The disruption you have to have. Higher he than has that. It. Could Say he it go higher. ahead of Tavon, could, could he go ahead of Tavondre Sweat? Yes. Could Dwayne Carter go ahead of Tavondre Sweat? What would yes. you say there? Yes. And who would have had that on their bingo card back in September or back during the uh, Texas run Not to me. the college football yep. semifinals? I think Dwayne Carter does go ahead of Tavondre Sweat. I think he belongs in the third round at worst, Mel. He is one of my guys for a reason. And finally, last one here, Mel. Let's go out. To the great state of South Dakota. Miles Harden, a cornerback who's from the Miami area. I don't know how the heck they found him all the way up to South Dakota from Miami. I guess those bigger schools were overlooking him, Mel. I like tough corners, and this kid is tough. Six interceptions during his college career, five forced fumbles, 26 pass breakups, over 140 career tackles from Miles Harden. Excellent ball skills. He was down there at the Shrine Bowl. Showed out there as well. Showed that he can hang with good competition. We're in a 4-5-0 at the, at the Combine Mail, which is just fine, right? That's not going to be the kind of 40 that's going to knock you so far down the boards. I think he goes somewhere on day three, perhaps as early as round four. But if he falls in around six or seven, the competitiveness, the toughness, the edge that he brings, the ball skills, to me, Miles Harden will be a round six or seven heist. That's the thing, Field. Let's not get wrapped up too much in these 40-yard dash times. How do they play? Okay, how does it translate to the field? 4-5, oh, didn't Terry and Arnold run a 4-5? He's going to go in the first round. TJ Tampa, my guy, oh, he ran a 4-5-2, 4-5-3, whatever. Hey, he plays a lot faster. He plays like he runs 4-4-5. To me, Miles Harden, I don't care about the 4-5. Like you say, physical presence out there with ball skills and the ability to locate. If you can't locate the ball down the field, turn at the right time and locate the ball, then you got no shot in the NFL. So for the guys that can do that, I don't care about 40 speed. It's great to have it if you got all the other things, but that doesn't define who you are. Nothing wrong with 4-5 speed if you have the other things that make you an outstanding cornerback. All right, a lot of fun there picking our guys during the process. Now, we probably could have done an entire show with about 25 of those for each of us. We wanted to make sure that we gave you <laughs> a couple of names. So before we wrap up here, Matt, with this portion of the show, is there a player that you think could go in the first round mm -hmm. that might be a bit of a surprise based off of what people are reading right now in mock drafts? Surprise for mock drafts. I'd say probably the, the only one that I would say we say surprises would be Keon Coleman. And I don't say it's a surprise field. It's an inch, the most interesting player in this draft. I had people in the league tell me before the combine, if he runs 4-5-5, five, five, he's a guaranteed first-round pick. 
If he runs 4-6, he's a second-round pick. Yeah. What did he run, Field? Ran 4-6-1, Mel. 4-6. Yeah. So, again, yeah, 4-6-1. But what did he do? He but and we say learning from mistakes is a key scouting, right? We mentioned Puka Nakua, but brought up Cooper Cup. We can go with the Jerry Rice, right? Jerry Rice didn't have any great forty time coming out of Mississippi Valley State, a lower level competition. That's why he was a third receiver taken in a great receiver class that year with three studs. He turned out to be great for Bill Walsh and the 49ers because he was a route runner and he caught the ball. Even though he had some drops early on in camp, right? He got it together. But had a Hall of Fame career. To me, I think when you look at a guy like Keon Coleman, basketball background, Michigan State. High point the ball, catch radius. Jordan Travis had a heck of a year. Punt returner, showed explosiveness there. Gauntlet drill, you talked about that. Straight line and the speed he showed there. Does Keon Coleman field get into the second round? Is He's a borderline one. I just want to see. We talk about learning from mistakes of Pukum Nakua, who was a fifth-round pick. What did Pukum Nakua play like, Field? A first-round yeah, pick, maybe right? Maybe like a top five pick. He only ran a pick. four, five, yeah. seven, forty. Yeah. Keon Coleman. To me, and I don't know about a surprise first, but I haven't seen him any mock first. Have you? I haven't recently, Mel. It's been a while. C certainly not since that 4 6 one uh, But I love the player. We've talked about this guy so much during this this, this process, Mel. And, yes, the 4 6 one is going to be a detriment in some teams' eyes from using a top 32 or top 40 pick. But the – I would say the aggression he plays with, the instincts. I mean, how about the run after catch skills, by the way? The guy was the primary punt returner for Florida State last year, 25 of those for 300 yards. There's way too much to like about Keon Coleman to not think he deserves at least a shot to be an end of first round pick. I'll give you one more. Mel might be a surprise. Another Seminole. Not sure it'll happen, but Braden Fisk, a defensive tackle from Florida State, who I think has aced the pre draft process, Mel, but really aced the last five weeks of last season as well. Had six sacks during his final five games. That included three against Louisville in the ACC championship game. The two detriments for Braden Fisk are the fact that he's got, you know, 31-inch arms, 292 pounds, and also that'll be 25 in January of 2025, so an older prospect. But I think he goes in the second round. If he slides into round one, there are certainly a lot of good tape to support why a team will be enamored by a guy like Braden Fisk. All right, coming back in just a moment here to wrap things up on first draft with some final thoughts before we say goodbye for the final time until the 2024 NFL draft. All right, back here on first draft, Field Yates and Mel Kuyper Jr. So, Mel, before we say goodbye, anything you want to get off your chest, this is your last time in this forum to do that before the games begin. So many players feel that we sit here and say we think we have an idea where they'll go, but there's a fine line between being a second rounder, third rounder, and dropping into day three. That's why this year with so many players on the offensive line at offensive attack, we talk about how many will go in the first round. The depth at wide receiver, well into the 20s of guys we think can play, right? We talk about cornerback. There's some guys that can cover, slot, and outside. Edge rushers. It's going to be really interesting to see where some of these guys. I think there's some real sleep. I think there's some Mohammed Kamara been raving about from Colorado State, right? Jalex Hunt out of Houston Christian. Let's see where Jalex Hunt goes. I think he can go early to mid third round. Yeah. Some have him in the sixth, seventh round. I, I'm really curious. That's why I can't wait to see how my board and your board field as well, when you're looking at shapes up at the end of the day when we see where these guys went. And that tells you who the steals are, in our opinion, who the reaches are. And that we don't know that until draft day because we, we all think our guys we like are going to go where we think they're going to go. Right. We're sitting there on draft day saying, what the heck? My yeah. guy a third round grade this guy, and here we are in the sixth round. What happened? Yeah. That's, the, that's the entertaining part of the draft that we all love, Field, is when we have a guy graded at a certain point, and we're all seeing the same things, right? But we all see things differently and uh, how are those differences of opinion going to come together on Thursday Friday and Saturday that's why millions and millions of people feel will be watching the most interesting fascinating entertaining draft we've ever had since I've been doing it and we I go back to 1978 79 with this if any 30 second soundbite could more accurately capture the essence of the 2024 NFL draft I'd like to see it but that was a great description right there from my guy Mel Kuyper Jr. of course check out Mel Every minute of every hour of the 2024 NFL Draft coverage on ESPN. We can't wait. I'll see you over on ABC for Thursday and Friday and then join Mel on Saturday. Thanks, everybody, for watching First Draft throughout the season. we we'll back on a Thursday show, which will be the live show from Wednesday night plus Monday of next week. In the meantime, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review, and listen on Amazon Music wherever you get your podcasts.